愛と勇気の RPG が始まる<音楽>この星を救えますかこの愛が守れますかスターオーシャンセカンドストーリーエニックス The Golden Age of JRPGs. Depending on who you ask to define this, you'll probably get different answers. Some may say it's a 16 bit generation, as it built upon what the 8 bit generation did and nearly perfected the 2D RPG. Others may point to the PS2 era, as it continued many classic JRPG series and gave us a wide array of amazing 3D titles. Hell, it can even be argued that we're going through a second Golden Age right now with JRPGs making a huge comeback. If you were to ask me, though, what the initial Golden Age was, only one answer comes to mind. None other than the PS1. Don't get me wrong, some of my all time favorites are still on the Super Nintendo and PS2 and GameCube, but the PS1 though? Aw、oh、man, it's just my shit. I think your answer to this question will likely be influenced by which generation you grew up with, and well, I'm not gonna lie, I'm no exception. I played many PS1 JRPGs during my transformative childhood years, and so I'm not gonna act like there's not a little bit of bias at play here. The games you played when you're like 9, 10, 11 years old are just always gonna hit different. However, nostalgia aside, I do still believe a strong case can be made here. First of all, you got a mix of incredible 2D RPGs and incredible 3D RPGs. You could kind of say the same thing about the PS2, but definitely not to this degree. Secondly, just look at this frickin' catalog. You got Squaresoft doing Squaresoft things with Final Fantasy VII, VIII, and IX, Chrono Cross, Xenogears, Parasite E, Vagrant Story, etc. Suikoden 1 and 2, Wild Arms 1 and 2, Breath of Fire 3, Breath of Fire 4, Tales of Destiny, Tales of Eternia, Grandia, Legend of Lagaia, The Legend of Dragoon, and yeah, you get the idea. Out of all these outstanding titles, though, there's only a select handful that can be in the upper echelon the pantheon of PS1 RPGs. In my opinion, one of these has undoubtedly got to be Star Ocean The Second Story. In this video, I'm going to play through the original PS1 classic in both Claude and Reyna scenarios and see just how well it holds up 25 years later. I know by the time this comes out, the remake, Second Story R, will likely already have been released. However, we won't be covering that version here. I mean, let's be honest, it's probably going to be the go to version for most new players going forward due to accessibility, so the original is only going to get more forgotten with time, sadly. Just consider this our way of remembering and immortalizing the OG on YouTube. With that said, I will go over some of the version differences in the next section, along with my personal history of the game, before we start the main part of the video. Before we do that, though, just make yourself comfy and get some snacks as we play out the intro. We're gonna be here for a while. The light is your guide. Dream is what keeps you. So, as is obvious by the title, Star Ocean The Second Story is the second game in the Star Ocean series. The first Star Ocean came out for the Super Famicom, and that version never left Japan. We covered that one in a retrospective earlier in the year, but I'll just give my quick thoughts here. It's got amazing presentation and really ambitious ideas, however, it's also got poor execution in some mechanics, pacing issues, and a story that never quite lives up to the potential of its premise. In fact, it's made it a prime candidate for our most recent video about kind of great RPGs that didn't reach their full potential. With that said, it provided a very strong foundation for Star Ocean 2 to build upon. And build upon, it absolutely did. Star Ocean The Second Story was released for the PlayStation on July 30th, 1998 in Japan, May 31st, 1999 in North America, and April 12th, 2000 in Europe. Like the previous title, Enix was a publisher and Triace was a developer. Man, what a duo these two are. They're also the team behind Valkyrie Profile, another absolute banger. Anyway, Star Ocean 2 was received pretty well when it came out, however, not as good as it should have been, I'd argue. It sold a little over a million copies worldwide and has about an 80 on Metacritic. While this is definitely a really good score, I do think it should be higher. Regardless of its exact reception, Enix was aware of its popularity with fans. They released not one, but two manga series on the game, 
an anime series, and drama CDs to finish what the anime started. They even created a direct sequel for the Game Boy Color called Blue Sphere. This one never left Japan though, unfortunately. With that said, there is a fan translation, and while this one's a lot different than Second Story, it's still a pretty good game and really beautiful for the Game Boy Color. So yeah, Star Ocean 2 was a pretty big hit overall, big enough that it also got a port to the PSP in 2009. This was called Second Evolution, and the company Toes was responsible for it. Well, I guess calling it a port's not entirely accurate as they added a lot of new stuff. There's new voice acting, new character portraits, a new optional character by the name of Welch, additional endings, private actions, and a new localization. Some of these changes are nice, but not all of them. I think the art looks way more generic and lacks the charm of the original. The voice acting is technically better, but it also removes a lot of the charm. Like the original, it's so bad it's good and exudes that 90s cheese. The new voice acting, on the other hand, is... fine. It's not bad, it's not great, it's just fine. This makes it not as memorable, though. With that said, there is way more of it, as some dialogue outside battle is now voiced as well. Well, there are people still waiting for us, so we should be taking our leave. However, the biggest change that actually affects the gameplay is the inclusion of a three-hit combo. Every melee fighter now has a three-hit combo instead of a single attack, and this makes the game way easier. It also makes some killer moves kind of useless. Overall, I do prefer the original, not only because of the difficulty, but because of the art and voices as well. It just gives it a different vibe, you know? Now, as far as the newest remake, by the time of recording, I have not played through it fully, but I did get to play a demo of it at the Square Enix booth at PAX West. Got the sticker for proof. It only took over an hour of waiting, but eh, it's all good. It was worth the wait. I made a community post back then that summed up my impressions and all the differences that I noticed. As you can see here, there are quite a lot of changes. I can't wait to dive into it fully. For this video, though, it's all about the PS1 version. I'll never forget that day browsing Blockbuster as a young tyke when I came across Star Ocean the second story. I picked up the case, turned it around at the back, read about the over 80 possible endings, and my 9 year old mind was just blown. I had never seen anything like that before and couldn't even fathom it. I was pretty early on in my JRPG journey back then and had probably only played like 5 to maybe 10 tops at this point. Little did I know that I was about to dive into one of the most magical experiences the genre has to offer. Like all of our other retrospectives, any late game spoilers will be marked with timestamps, but anything in the first disc, I consider fair game. Now, without further ado, join me on this journey as we take a deep dive and nostalgic look back at this ahead of its time Tri Ace Classic. This, my friends, is a retrospective over Star Ocean The Second Story. Okay, so the game begins with some setting options. By the way, I love this track playing in the background. It's the only time it plays in the entire game, and it's so relaxing. I'm playing this on my laptop, so let's set sound to monaural, vibration mode on, and okay, here comes the real decision. We have to choose between either one of two protagonists, Claude C. Kinney or Raina Lanford. Ultimately, the game doesn't change that much. However, since you are playing from a different perspective, you do get to see different insight to events, as well as get to experience some new scenes entirely. You get more Galactic Federation lore with Claude and more local fantasy lore with Reyna. The biggest difference though is the exclusive party member at each playthrough. In Claude's scenario, you can recruit Leon, and in Reyna's scenario, you can recruit Diaz. I'll talk about them later, but I will say Diaz is definitely the stronger of the two. Let's just say you never really see Leon in any in-game party recommendations. Magic users in general just get outclassed by melee fighters in this game. As I mentioned earlier, I am going to be playing both for this video. However, I am going to show footage from mainly Claude's scenario first. In my opinion, he has a more compelling prologue and it just feels more Star Ocean-y. I think Reyna's story gets more interesting later on though. For battle mode, I'm gonna set it to semi-active. 
you can still free run and it just makes targeting easier. After choosing Claude, we get a nice animated cutscene, complete with voiceover, to start the game. This explains some background information and how it ties into the first game. Instead of explaining it all myself, I'll just let it play out. Only the vast reaches of outer space can hold the myriad dreams of 10 billion people and still show them its infinite possibilities. Countless dreams expand through the vastness of space. But of course, some of them are nightmares. Soon after their first contact in Gamma Sector, the intelligent life forms on the planet Rizonia began a confrontation with the Earth Federation. The flames of war erupted in a violent maelstrom. In the space year 342, aboard the battleship Karnas, he led our forces to victory in battle against Rizonia and received the Medal of Valor. In the space year 345, he solved the mystery of the virus outbreak on the undeveloped frontier planet Rogue. He then thwarted the treacherous plot hatched in the aftermath of Rizonia by G. Revors, leader of the planet Farget. In recognition of this meritorious service, he was promoted to Admiral at the unprecedented young age of 38. He was my father, and no one respected him more than me. I also knew that he held a fine position as an officer in the Earth Federation. Yet, I am my own person. I will not be merely the puppet son of Admiral Ronicus J. Kenny, hero of the Earth Federation. And now, I am here. Okay, so there's some bad audio mixing once the music starts, so if you couldn't hear, long story short, Claude is the son of Ronixus, a playable character from the first game. I think this connection is really cool. You don't need to play the first game to understand the story here, but for those that have, it's a nice callback. Kind of a shame the audio mixing is so poor though, I actually thought his voiceover sounded pretty decent here. Anyway, we're now on an uncharted planet. We are now an ensign, so Pops gives us a phase gun to protect ourselves with. Next screen over, we see a big ass door and need to find a way for it to open Sesame. Huh, I wonder what this panel in front of the door does. Surely it doesn't open the d Ah, would you looky here? Who would have thought? Alright, now we're inside and let's check out the menu screen real quick. Pretty good stuff here. I like the UI. I also like how it shows the name of the game. Just in case you forgot what you were playing, here's a little reminder. I do think the default window color looks good, but considering there's a way to change it, you bet your ass I'm going to. I always love when games do this. Being able to customize the color in each corner and create the vibe you want, it's just cool. If you don't like the color I picked, don't worry, I change it like three more times as I get tired of it too. Anyway, Claude chooses to enter himself in the running for the next Darwin Award as he approaches a mysterious device after his way more experienced dad warns him multiple times not to. Yeah, maybe not the sharpest tool in the shed this guy is. Claude C. Kenny? More like Claude C. Plenty danger signs and obvious warnings but still go touch glowy object anyway. The arrogance and unfounded confidence to blatantly ignore not only his dad's but his commander's orders and just be like, Nah, it's good dude, I'm fine, don't worry about it. Claude has some great moments later on, but this is not one. Anyway, that mysterious device transports us somewhere and we now awaken in an unknown forest. I just gotta say, the track playing in the background, The Venerable Forest, is my favorite in the entire game. Probably no surprise considering we started the video off with it. It's so good and instantly takes me back to my first time playing this as a kid. This is the only place it plays that in the game, but man, does it make a hell of a first impression on you. We try to use our communicator, but alas, it does not work. Well, might as well walk around and see what we can find. We then see this giant gorilla monster chasing Reyna, so we go to help. Well, I guess we don't know it's Reyna yet, but I mean, come on, yeah, it's Reyna. We now enter on our first battle, which is barely even a real battle. We just phase gun this dude to oblivion. After we save her life, Reyna does what any person would usually do in this situation and just runs off, so we chase after her. I like Claw's little animation when she leaves. I also like how he mentions the phase gun violating the undeveloped planet protection treaty. It's a small detail, but it just adds to the lore and fleshes out the world, you know? Or universe, I should say. We chase her to the next screen, and God, this screen is so beautiful. So many backgrounds in this game are truly stunning. I never fully appreciated it as a kid, but I remember playing the PSP version in high school one time and being like, Dude, these backgrounds look good as fuck. 
Anyway, Claude and Raina introduce themselves, and then Claude asks where we're even at. Next screen, Claude tells Raina we're from Earth, to which she has no idea what we're talking about, obviously, before Raina welcomes us to Arlia Village. The shot of them walking to the village as the camera pans up is iconic. Such a gorgeous view. Once we get to the village, Raina says we can walk around for a bit first while she takes care of some things. Well, let's do just that. When talking to people, they're all confused when we bring up stuff like spaceships and machines, and it really helps sell that fish out of water feeling. This is why I like Claude's prologue more. You don't really get that same feel with Raina's. I mean, you do get to see that cool CGI cutscene of Claude being transported to Shingo Forest, but besides that, I feel like there's not as much of a sense of mystery as Claude's. Like on the character select screen, we can read about him, so we already know who he is, therefore there's no real mystery there. But in Claude's case, I don't know anything about Arlia Village, so I'm learning about it along with him. And plus, Reyna also kind of just feels like a passenger in Claude's story at first. Like, you have to get saved and watch him fight, you get kidnapped, incoming spoiler in the next two minutes. And yeah, it just feels like it's built around Claude's story in the beginning. This does change later, but we'll touch on that, well, later. Anyway, Arlie is quite the sight to behold though. I like all the small touches this game adds, like the birds flying in the sky and seeing your reflection in the water. You can even see your reflection in mirrors. I know these sound like obvious, no big deal things, but not every PS1 game had these minor details down. It's a nice little way to add some more realism and immersion. After some walking around, we eventually end up at Raina's pad. She then decides to come with us and show us around town. Kind of just did that already, but yeah, I mean, sure, let's go. Like, literally everyone comments on us being boyfriend and girlfriend and is like, okay, let's calm down a bit here, let's uh, not assume things. That is one thing I'll say, the romance does feel pretty forced early on. I mean, I get why Claude and Reyna would have this initial attraction to each other given the circumstance, but so many people comment on this. Like, even after this village, it's just constant remarks from NPCs about them being boyfriend and girlfriend. Claude kind of harbors some jealous feelings later that I'll touch on, but when people make constant comments like this, it's like, I don't blame them too much. After Raina takes us to every house, we go back to her place. Apparently, Raina's mom was busy while we were gone cooking up a smorgasbord. It's a fun word to say you don't get to say too often. Smorgasbord. Getting transported to a foreign world works up an appetite, so you boys pretty hungry. Time to feast. One hour later, Raina food shames us, Claude throws some shade at his mom's cooking, and then Raina goes downstairs while we chill for a bit. We try to go in her room, can't do that. Try to go downstairs, can't do that either, so just wait around for a bit, I guess. Eventually, Raina's mom comes upstairs, asks us about her cooking, and then accidentally calls us the warrior. She then runs back downstairs in embarrassment, so we follow her. If you were playing as Raina, you actually go and grab the mare while Claude was just waiting around, so when we get downstairs, they're already there. The camera angle and pre-rendered backgrounds then change perspective as we sit down for a talk. Star Ocean 2 does this a lot and does not get enough credit for it, I feel. Like, you'll be in the same environment you've been in before, but it simply just shifts perspectives and it makes the scene feel entirely different. They didn't need to create a new background to show the same house we've already been in before, but they did because they care and wanted to go the extra mile to make sure some scenes were more effective. Honestly, off the top of my head, I don't really think any other PS1 RPG does this really. At least not to this degree. Like the Squaresoft RPGs have some amazing backgrounds, don't get me wrong, but after you see a background in a location, it typically just stays that way. Anyway, the mayor then accuses us of being the warrior of legend. Apparently, there's an Expellian legend that says when the world is in danger, a warrior wearing alien raiments and wielding a sword of light will appear and save the people. Claude's like, wait, sword of light? I don't got that shit. And then Rain is like, wait, what about that weapon you used when you saved me? It shot out a dazzling beam of light. Oh yeah, the phase gun. Yeah, that was pretty suspicious, I guess. Claude's like, I get it, but uh, this is a mistake, trust me. Raina then says something about some sorcery globe, to which we have no idea what she's talking about. The mayor's then like, alright, well let me explain then, kiddo, it's story time. Three months ago, a mysterious meteorite landed on a nearby continent in the Kingdom of El, and uh, shit has kind of been going haywire since. This is a reused plot point from the first game, but just done way better this time. The meteorite not only attracted a bunch of violent demons, but it also brought upon various natural disasters. Naturally, everyone started to blame the meteorite for the sudden shift in, well, bad shit happening. It was then dubbed the Sorcery Glow because, that, I mean, I mean, it sounds cool, I guess. Claude's then like, hey man, that sucks, but yeah, I don't really got anything to do with it, though. This disappoints Reyna, she seemed to place a lot of hope in Claude being the warrior of legend. Given the circumstance, it's understandable, and I don't blame her. In fact, she's so disappointed, she just straight up leaves. The mayor then tells us to try not to do anything to draw attention regarding this, as in these hard times, people are desperate to cling to hope. Since we really have no place to go, the mayor offers his place to crash at. Well, alright, let's tune in for the night.
The next morning, the maid greets us, then we head downstairs. The mayor suggests we go to the mining town of Salva up north to gather some more information. Before we head out, he hands us a sword to use instead of the face gun. You know, low profile and all that. We can actually just head there directly now, however, we can also talk to Rain in the Shingo Forest first to get some hidden affection points. This hidden affection system determines which of 80 plus endings you're gonna get, but I'll touch more on this later. Claude and Rain are clear of their misunderstanding and then she asks if she can be left alone for a bit. Alright, we grant her request and head to Salva. On the way out though, we see this shady ass dude with a cape. He won't say anything when we try to talk to him either, so yeah, I don't like the look of this. To get to Salva, we have to go on the overworld map, however, it is a really short journey. Once we get there, we pretty much just bullshit around talking to some people. We find out that the mayor's away right now, but his son, Alan, is apparently acting weird as fuck. I guess he found this mysterious stone recently that's made him act all strange and hold himself up in his room all day, jerking it to pics of Reyna. <laughs> I'm not even really joking, he's got a portrait of her in her room, and even people in Arlia were like, yeah, he's been trying to get at her for like, ever. Okay, yeah, I'm kind of getting a bad feeling about all this. Let's, uh, let's head back to Arlia. Well, yeah, okay, Th this is not good. Apparently, Reyna was kidnapped by Alan, who was that shady-ass dude by the forest earlier. Probably should have done something there. And he took her back to his mansion in Salva. Well, you know what that means. It's Claude C. Kenny in time. We volunteer to bring her back, because that's just what we do. So, we head back to Salva and go up to Alan's mansion. We use the last of the phase gun's energy to shoot down the front door. We find Raina's hairpin in one of the rooms, so she's gotta be around here somewhere. Ah, a hidden passage behind a bookcase. Never seen that before. You don't really see pre-rendered backgrounds move around too much, so this animation looks pretty cool. Upon entering, we see this guy just posted up. I guess he was hired by Alan to build a strange altar in the back, but when he saw him trying to bring Raina back there, he tried to stop them, but took a massive L. He warns us to be careful, as apparently there is something wrong with Alan. Alright, I've had enough of this edgelord in the cave, let's go beat the shit out of him. We now have a small dungeon section to get through, before we wind up at the altar. When we get there, Alan's creepy ass has her tied up to an altar bed as he's about to perform some wedding ceremony. We go over to untie Reyna, and then the power of the mysterious stone pushes us back, and then transforms him into a hideous monster, and yeah, we got our first boss fight here. It's pretty easy though, we just button mash our way to victory. After we kick his ass, he's back in his human form, so Reyna heals him back to consciousness. Since the stone is now destroyed, he's acting all normal and has no idea what just happened. We go back to the mansion, he apologizes, and then we set out for Arlia. We get a nice warm welcome when we get back, then we head over to the mayor's. Again, watch how the background shifts perspectives here as we're about to have a talk. So cool. The mayor thanks us for saving Reyna again, and then asks for some more details on what exactly happened. We tell him about that mysterious stone that seemed to make him mad, to which this leads Raina to believe, maybe this has something to do with the sorcery globe. Huh, not a bad theory, kid. The mayor agrees and then asks us to investigate the sorcery globe. Because Claude really has no leads right now and the situation does seem pretty strange, he comes to the conclusion that there may be some benefit for him. We agree to help, but not because we're trying to save the world, but because it's in everyone's mutual interest. Raina then asks if she can tag along. At first Claude's all like, no way, this is not happening. Then the mayor persuades him into it and he's like, well, okay. But only if you ask your mom first. Reyna agrees and then the mayor tells her to be careful on her five second walk home. We go back inside and the mayor wants to have another talk. The mayor asks us if Reyna healed our wounds. We say yes and then he's like, yeah, our people don't really do that. You see, Reyna is different. She is not Wes's real child and was found in the Shingo forest when she was two years old. We then get a flashback sequence showing this. The shot of baby Reyna crying next to that space capsule thing, it's kind of giving me Goku vibes. We ask if Reyna knows about this, the mayor says no, so we ask if there are any clues as to where she could be from, to which he says, well, there is this one pendant that she has, but that's about it. Huh. Okay. Anyway, I guess we'll talk about this later. It's time for bed. Before we can catch some Z's, though, we hear a sound of the upstairs window. Hey, look who it is. It's Reyna. She asks if we can come down and talk, to which Claude's like, hell yeah. We meet her by the bridge in the middle of town, and man, again, the perspective change. This is such a beautiful shot, and the scene has always stuck with me. Like, when I think of this game, this is one of the first scenes I think of. If this scene had played out in the usual top-down perspective of this location, it wouldn't have nearly as much impact or be as memorable for me. It's the little things, you know? Anyway, Rain explains her real reason for wanting to come with us. She knows she's not from here. She overheard Weston the mayor talking one time about how she's not really her real child. 
I guess her pendant came from her previous mother, so yeah, she wants to find her real mother. I really like this next bit when Claude's like, well, what about Westa? She's raised you and loved you your entire life. Rain is in like, yeah, I know, Westa is my only mother. I only want to find my birth mother to learn more about myself and where I'm from. It's a good message. I'm down with it. Anyway, we got a long journey ahead of us. Time for bed for real this time. The next morning, the mayor suggests that we go to the Kingdom of Cross and talk to the king to see if we can get some information. So, off to the Kingdom of Cross we go. This is where the story of Star Ocean 2 truly begins. Man, what a prologue. As you guys can see, Star Ocean 2 starts off very exposition heavy. There's not a whole lot of action in the first hour or two, but honestly, I don't mind this. I don't mind slow starts as long as the premise is compelling enough, and to me, it is. I just really like the vibe and the atmosphere, and I think that helps a lot. In fact, I'm just gonna say it, I think Arlie is one of my favorite starting towns. I don't know if I'd quite place it on Arnie Village status, but it's up there for me with other classics like Rim Elm from Legend of Lagaya and Town of Maria from Wild Arms 2. It's just a cozy little place with awesome, relaxing music. I want to go back to what I said about vibe and atmosphere, though. Star Ocean 2 has a very unique, specific atmosphere, and to me personally, it's a pretty big reason why I vibe with this game so much. It's not just one thing either, but so many different factors contribute to this. Let's start with the visual style. PS1 RPGs came in various forms. Sometimes they were full 2D, like Alundra or Suikoden. Sometimes they were full 3D, like the Grand Stream Saga or Guardian's Crusade. But I would say most commonly, they came in one of two styles. Sprites on 3D backgrounds, or 3D models on pre-rendered backgrounds. The former had the Breath of Fire series, Grandia, Final Fantasy Tactics, Xenogears, and etc. And the latter had Final Fantasy VII through IX, Chrono Cross, Jade Cocoon, The Legend of Dragoon, and etc. What you didn't see too often, though, was a combination of the two sprites on pre-rendered backgrounds. Star Ocean 2 does this, and it looks phenomenal. The only other PS1 RPG I know that had this style was Saga Frontier, and that game also looked awesome. If there's any that I'm not thinking of though, let me know in the comments. I'm genuinely curious as I love this style. And before anyone brings up Saga Frontier 2 and Legend of Mana, yes, those are very gorgeous, but they're hand-drawn backgrounds, not pre-rendered. Anyway, I just feel this gives Star Ocean 2 such a cool, unique look. It's not just the visual style that makes this atmosphere so special though. It's everything about the presentation in general. There's just such a strong aesthetic here, and a lot of the backgrounds have so much detail. Like, look at Priestess's house. This is such a vibe, dude. Both the living room and her room. Then you got these places on energy need, but there's all this technology and screens flashing, and the attention to detail, it's just so good. To further illustrate my point, just look at all the paintings in this game. Like, almost every building, no matter if it's a house or a shop, has some type of painting in it, and I think they're all unique. Most of them at least. Did they need to do this? No, but they cared about the aesthetic of their world and creating a strong vibe and I dig it. So many times I just stopped to look at paintings. Catch our next video, Top 10 Paintings in Star Ocean 2. For real though, there really are no generic houses or shops, like every place has its own character and uniqueness. This is probably best shown by every single shop and inn having its own name like an actual business. This in addition to the interior design really gives every place its own personality. Like, look at this dope-ass sushi spot in Hurley. Dude, I want to eat here. This place looks good. Even the shopkeepers themselves have personality. Like, there's just one chick who's all super bubbly and cheery. Then there's that old lady from Mars who's in the back room and can't even hear you because she's hard of hearing. And, yeah. Obviously, little details like this don't really mean anything, but they just add to the world, you know? It just helps them feel like actual people and not robotic NPCs. The world building in general in this game is just spectacular. However, I'll touch on this a bit later. The distinct personality extends beyond individual buildings though, but to the entire town as well. Like when I was playing Wild Arms recently for our retrospective earlier in the year, I really, really enjoyed it, but a lot of the towns felt kind of samey. To be fair, given its setting, it, it does make sense, but it also just makes remembering what town is what kind of hard sometimes. This is not the case with Star Ocean 2. Every town is distinct with its own thing going on. 
Well, I guess the Kingdom of Cross and Kingdom of Lacor are quite similar, but besides this, they're all pretty different. Besides Arlia, I think my favorite town is Mars, where Selene's from. It's a quiet little cozy village filled with magic users. I like it. The first planet, Expel, is just a really cool place in general. It's like this unique mix of mainly fantasy and a little bit of modern day. Like there's kings and castles and medieval weapons, but then there's also stuff like that aforementioned sushi shop, a more modern looking clothing store, universities, and yeah, stuff like that. Now, if you go back to Salva later on, everyone's talking about going to this frat party. This person also misspells tonight over here and... Alright, who wrote this part? Maybe this isn't the best example, it's just an intern fucking around, but anyway, yeah, you get my point. It's a very creative, time-era blending place, and it's just awesome. Earlier I mentioned how the background shift perspective at times, and I kind of want to elaborate on that a bit further. The cinematography in general is just excellent. The game knows how and when to effectively use close-up shots. I touched on some examples earlier, but another one that sticks out to me is the beginning of this too. The shot of your party walking and talking down that path, it's just so stunning. The first 10 minutes of this 2 in general hit pretty hard. Oh, and everything leading up to it, of course. The music all plays a big factor here as well, and yeah, you know we gotta talk about this. The final part in the atmosphere equation. Let's not beat around the bush, but Toy Sakuraba absolutely fucking killed it here. I know this is a bold statement, but this might be my favorite of his works. Bat and Kaidos and Golden Sun are close, but I don't know, man. There's just something about this OSD. To me, the biggest standouts are the town themes and the dungeon themes. Oh, and the battle themes are pretty good too, I guess. The towns have like this calming ethereal sound and they're just so chill. I think my favorites are the tracks from Arlia, Salva, Mars, and the Snowtown giveaway. And the dungeon themes? Yeah, these are great. It's like upbeat progressive rock and just amps you up to explore. The use of a motif is also good in this game. Rana's theme gets remixed various times and it gives the game some identity. I feel like I've been reading a lot of criticism on Sakuraba recently and on one hand I get it, a lot of his work in the Tales series is kind of generic and forgettable, however he's also came out on record to say that Namco gives him strict directions for a specific sound on those games. When you look at the sheer catalog of all his work, his greatness is undeniable. The rest of the Star Ocean series, Valkyrie Profile, Baton Kaidos, Golden Sun, Shining Force 3, the Mario Sports games, fucking Dark Souls. Throw some respect on this dude's name. Dude's been putting out bangers since I was kicking it as a fetus. Even his early tales work is excellent. Outside of some exceptions, he's not always the best at creating catchy melodies, but his use of instrumentation is just so great in creating specific vibes. And by the way, his dungeon and battle themes here are very similar to those found in Valkyrie profiles. If you like those tracks here, you'll like them there too. But yeah, overall though, this is just an amazing OST. It's a great mix of relaxing and majestic. Gotta be one of the more underrated JRPG OSTs out there, in my opinion. Anyway, moving on. I think it's time to talk combat. Oh, it's just them. I will win. So, the battle system in this game... Okay. I really like it and have a lot of fun with it, so is it good in the sense that it can be fun for some people like me? Yes, I guess, but would I call it good on a mechanical level? Not really. Even us biggest Star Ocean 2 fans gotta admit the combat is a uh, pretty one note and spammy. Outside some exceptions, the strategy pretty much just boils down to having the right setup and spamming your strongest killer moves, and regular attacks too sometimes. Essentially, you want to try to stunlock enemies as much as possible so they can barely get any attacks off, preventing them from doing the same thing to you. A lot of stuff around combat, like the item creation system and skill system are very deep, but the combat itself does not have that much depth. You're not actually dodging, you're blocking, or parrying anything yourself. You just have to level up these skills high enough and sometimes your character will do them automatically. For an action RPG, it definitely leans more toward the RPG side than the action side. Having the right gear set up is huge. Same with your killer moves. You can map a killer move to both shoulder buttons and yeah, you're gonna be touching more shoulders than Vegeta. As soon as I learned Head Splitter for Claude, I just spammed this for like 90% of the game. It allows you to move across the battlefield super quickly and is a great way to target enemies that are standing still casting. It does miss a decent amount, but it at least gets you in range of enemies and doesn't cost that much MP. I love using it the second the battle starts and seeing how high we can get Claude's ass to jump. Sometimes dudes even jumping higher than Axe Cop in that one episode where he outjumps Jumpman and Jump School. 
God, that was an obscure reference. Did anyone get that? With the optional content and on higher difficulty modes, there's certainly more strategy to be used. However, for the casual player on a casual playthrough, yeah, you're just going to be spamming a lot of the same moves throughout the entire game. There's only so much strategy you can use when all you have is a regular attack and two special moves, you know? Thankfully, you can play as any character, so this gives combat a lot of variety still. Obviously, not every character is as fun to play as, though. Like, I don't really know why you'd want to play as Raina directly when all you do is heal pretty much. Well, okay, I guess you don't have to make her heal, but that's what I do at least, because she's so good at it. The AI in this game is actually pretty good. Well, it's kind of bad too, but it's also good. Let me explain. It's good in the sense that your party is actually doing a lot of shit, like they're contributing a lot. Their damage output might not be quite as high as whoever you're controlling, but still, it's efficient. I feel like there's so many action RPGs I've played where your non-controlled party members are like barely doing anything and attacking at a snail's pace. Thankfully, that is not the case here. I was proud to call everyone a comrade in battle. Healers also do a great job of staying on top of healing and recovering status effects. You can also change the individual tactics for each member, and while there's not a lot of options, this is still nice. So yeah, overall the AI in a PS1 game for this style, I think it's really good. However, you think you spam a lot? Your party's out here spamming more things in the state of Hawaii. This is fine, as combat is all about spamming. However, sometimes I just spam the same move over and over and over and over again and never use the other. Like I swear, half the time Diaz is air slash equipped, he neglects his other killer move more than he neglects the idea of combing his hair. How is your hair both long and spiky? It's fine though, Air Slash does kick ass. But yeah, even with Opera though, this one time she used one of her moves over like 200 times and hadn't used her other move a single time yet. But then if I change that unused move to another move, she'll start using that one more. I don't quite understand how your characters prioritize certain moves over others, but it seems like there are certain move combinations where they'll just use the other one a lot more. Anyway, it's all good. The AI is at least helpful, so I appreciate that. You want to know what's not as helpful though? Spellcasters. They're very viable and powerful early on, like Selene wrecks shit at first, however later in the game they start getting outclassed. They just can't match the quickness and raw DPS of melee fighters. Plus, everything stops when spells are cast, so it just interrupts the flow and pacing of combat. Battles usually have this chaotic frenziness to them, and spells just take away from this feeling a bit. By the way, gotta love that harmony of sounds that all the battle grunts and your characters simultaneously yelling out their killer moves makes. Like you hear this right here? You know what that is? That's the sound of excellence, my friend. It's like this symphony of cheesy 90s voice acting, and it's fucking awesome. Also another reason why the PlayStation version just hits different. Speaking of hitting different, did you know if you use some killer moves enough times they can actually, well, hit different? I don't think this is ever explained anywhere, and I don't recall ever seeing a guide showing how they evolve. But yeah, basically, after a certain level of proficiency, some of your moves will either add an extra hit, become stronger or quicker, change the motion of your sword, and stuff like that. Not all of them evolve though. Deus's air slash never changes, for example, no matter how much you use it. It's already pretty OP, so yeah, makes sense. I completely forgot about this until this most recent playthrough, but there's also occasionally some environmental hazards. These happen very rarely though. The only times that instantly come to mind are the minecarts from the Hoffman Ruins and some giant boulders out by the Mountain Palace. Overall, there may not be the most depth or complexity to Star Ocean 2's combat, however, I can say this. It's just a lot of fun. I didn't even mind the somewhat high encounter rate because I was just having a good time. Battles themselves also move fairly quickly. Like many times, you can get in and out of battles, including loading times in like 30 seconds. That's awesome. It's night and day compared to something like, no, oh, let's say The Legend of Dragoon with its addition system, long loading times, and slow animations. This made grinding not bad at all. And yes, while Star Ocean 2 isn't extremely grindy, you're probably gonna want to sometimes. Especially near the end of the game. Some of the 10 wise men are tough. Grinding is also satisfying because not only do your characters get stronger after level ups, but they gain a lot of skill points as well. You'll start off only getting a few points per level up, but then near the end of the game, you'll be getting like 70 or 80 or more. It's such an exciting, rewarding feeling to open up your menu and see that you have like 500 points or something to spend on skills. Ha, huh, man, we straight splurging today. What are skills, you ask? Skills, skills are my special skill is... No, oh, yeah, let's talk about these a bit. Throughout the game, there are these guilds you can go to that you can buy and learn skills from. These range a lot. Some of them just improve your stats, some of them grant you combat skills, and others allow you to learn specialties. 
I already talked about the combat skills, and the stat skills are pretty self-explanatory. Definitely level up Perseverance first, though. This reduces the SP needed to learn each skill, and it's going to save you a lot down the road. It only costs 80 total points to max out to, which is a lot more forgiving than how it is in the first game. Specialties are these special functions that characters can perform that come in all sorts of shapes and forms. Some of them allow you to create items. Some of them reduce or increase the encounter rate. Some of them allow you to buy healing items deep in dungeons. And some of them let you write and publish books so you can earn royalties on them. <laughs> yes, yeah, Star Ocean 2 is super ambitious with all these systems. I won't get into the nitty gritty of each one, but yeah, there is a lot of stuff to do here. My favorite one is definitely pickpocketing. After you max this out, you can successfully steal from like every NPC in the game. Like, oh hey kid, you having a good time at Fun City? Enjoying the time with your parents? Got a nice little ice cream cone there and well, it's mine now, bucko, fuck off. You can actually get some really useful items and equipment doing this. Not all the specialties are useful though. Something like Oracle, the game even pokes fun at you for wasting time with it. But yeah, with some other specialties though, if you know what you're doing early on, you can pretty much break the game. The systems are very different, but it kind of reminds me of Final Fantasy VIII in this aspect, actually. I mean, hell, you can craft both Squall and Claw's best weapon in the first disc. You know, I wonder if there's a big overlap between Star Ocean 2 and Final Fantasy VIII fans. I'm in that camp, at least. Hmm, I got a theory here. Anyway, in addition to specialties, there's also super specialties. I'm just gonna call these soups. See, people love that cozy feeling that soups give them. Soups can be learned by multiple of your characters having certain specialties and skills. I mentioned publishing earlier, and that's actually an example of a soup. Other ones include stuff like Orchestra, Master Chef, Come On Bunny, and... Wait, Come On Bunny? What the hell's that? Yeah, I guess this calls a giant bunny for you to ride around on the world map. I can't believe I never knew about this until now. It's pretty helpful too, as there are no random encounters. I love how every character has their own voice clip for calling him. Come here, Barney! Come here, Barney! Hey, Barney! So it's like the bunny's name, Barney, or... Anyway, you gotta love Star Ocean 2 for little stuff like this. The last thing regarding the skill system is talents. Just like in real life, if you have talent for something, you're gonna be better at that skill. For the most part, what talents characters start with is completely RNG. However, you can learn them later on through other means. But not always. Like, unless Celine starts with it, she can never learn love for animals. Well, she was my favorite girl, but... Overall, all the skill and talent and item creation systems are just so incredibly deep and complex. It's actually insane how much stuff they put in here and how it still manages to all work so well for the most part. It's an absolute night and day improvement over how it was in the first Star Ocean game. My only real gripe is that it's not the most intuitive at times. Like some specialties have their own tabs, some you gotta go to items to access, and yeah, it just could have been handled a little bit better. I didn't even know about most of these as a kid due to this layout to be honest. This brings me to my next point. Star Ocean 2 is very much a game that you get out of it what you put in. Like, you can ignore all the specialty stuff that I just talked about, but you're also missing out on a pretty impressive part of the game. This extends far past that, though. If you only follow along the main story and never explore or adventure around, Star Ocean 2 is gonna feel pretty underwhelming. A lot of the best content in this game is completely optional. This is probably best exemplified by the fact that if you only follow along the main story, you're only gonna get six characters. There will be two obvious character slots non-filled up, and it's kind of like the game's way of telling you, yeah, you should have explored around more, kid. Make no mistake, two people playing Star Ocean 2 can have a very, very different experience. Like, if you never try to recruit Ashton or Opera, you never even have to go to the Mountain Palace or the Laskis Mountains. The latter is one of the prettiest locations in the entire game. It's like a whole big chunk of the world map you'll never even go to if you never choose to explore. It's not just Disc 1, either. You know the Snowtown giveaway that I mentioned earlier? Yeah, you never even need to go here in Disc 2. It's got a unique music track, it's the only snow town in the game, and you also learn a lot about the Ten Wisemen here. But yeah, the game's just like, if you want to come here, you will. Now with that said, I do think the second disc is a little rushed and could have been fleshed out more, but still, the point still stands. If you want to get the full Star Ocean 2 experience, you gotta explore. Not only just for pure content, but for the world building as well. There's just so many little details that add up that make the world feel alive. Like after Click gets destroyed in that natural disaster, a lot of people in towns all across Expel will talk about coming together to help out the remaining survivors. NPC dialogue gets updated pretty frequently based on events of the game, and it's great. There's so many other examples of little world building as well. Like the two Home Alone kids from Arlia whose dad was away at work. Well, it turns out he was a carpenter working on Alan's altar and he comes back afterwards. You got people making comments about Arlia having bad fashion. And hell, on Energy Need, the events from the first Star Ocean game exist as a comic book. 
Okay, this is maybe more before the wall break, but yeah, even still, the world building is just excellent. Going back to exploration, though, you also get rewarded a lot for this from a gameplay standpoint. Like after the prologue, when you set out for the Kingdom of Cross, you don't have to go straight there, as there are so many other places you can go to first. Before I even went to Cross, I first went to Mars, and then went to Hurley, and came across the Sinclair Saber in a chest. This is a pretty strong weapon for Claude at this point, and will last me for a while. I love being rewarded like this. What really ties all the optional content and exploration together, though, is the private action system. This is such a huge component of the game, and if you don't engage with it, you're really missing out. Private actions allow your party to split up upon entering towns. You can talk to them as they're just going about their day, and sometimes events can be triggered with them. Often, you'll learn about the character's personality and or their backstory through these. They can ask you a question, with your answer increasing or decreasing their affection points, or sometimes there's even items that can be gained. Besides Claude and Reyna, for your other characters, this is where they get the bulk majority of their personality shown. In fact, for the optional characters, this is the only time you get some insight into their personalities. These are truly what makes the characters memorable, not the main story. Honestly, if we're just going by the main story, most of the characters are pretty bland. For private actions, this is not the case though, they really shine here. The party members aside, there are also some solo events that can be triggered. This could be as simple as helping an old lady shop and being rewarded for it, or it could be clearing a town of bandits and fighting an optional boss. Yeah, you know how in Hurley there's that big ass mansion and people talking about how dangerous some parts of town are? This probably seemed like a random, unresolved thing, right? Well, the main story doesn't deal with this, but a private action does. This can only happen in Reyna's scenario, but basically, you have to save this dude named Yule from these bandits and then fight their big boss up in the mansion. He's got a unique sprite too, never seen anywhere else in the game. This is really cool, but it kind of just makes me question why they then reused the literal gorilla sprite in the Tournament of Arms. How did he talk to the front desk and register? Are they intelligent species or... Yeah, I don't know, so many questions. Anyway. You don't really get anything out of the side quest besides lower affection for all your male party members, but the fact that I can be playing this game 20 years later and still be discovering new stuff is just crazy. It's truly mind-boggling how much random, optional stuff there is in this game. So yeah, back to my original point. If you don't do private actions, you miss out on a lot. I also love that they give you a reason to revisit previous towns. This is a big thing Star Ocean 2 has over a lot of JRPGs, as in many of them, after you visit a town, you never really need to go back. This really helps make every town have a lasting impression on you. I hadn't played this game in like 10 years and still remembered every single town. This is why. By revisiting towns often, you also get to know the layout of your world a lot more. By the end of the game, I knew expel an energy need like the back of my hand. With that said, they're not the biggest worlds though, I will say that. Energy need in particular is quite small. You'd think in a sci-fi game like Star Ocean, you'd get some type of ship to fly around in, right? Well, no. Instead, you get this dragon, bird-like creature thing, and it's pretty fucking cool. I always love when RPGs give you unique creatures like this to fly on. Ball from Tales of Vesperia, Lombardia from Wild Arms 2, stuff like that. Man, that could be kind of a cool topic for a video. Hmm. Anyway, I'm just really glad that traveling around is really easy in this game compared to the first Star Ocean. In that one, there was no overworld map, and it was kind of confusing what ships took you to what towns. In this game, though, there's only one ship in the first disc, and it takes you to the same town. Streamlined and simple. Good stuff. Like the first Star Ocean could take like a half hour or something to backtrack the previous towns. In Star Ocean 2 though, I could walk all the way from Arlia to Hurley in like a few minute stops, including random battles. This is amazing. I will say there's no fast travel spell, which does kind of suck, but when the world's this easy to get around, it's not that big of a deal. While we're on the topic of exploration, we might as well talk dungeons. To me, a good dungeon needs to be one of two things. Functionally interesting, or aesthetically interesting. Star Ocean 2 definitely leans more towards aesthetically interesting. There are some puzzles, just not much. The atmosphere in some of these though? Truly top notch. I already talked about how good the music is, but the environments themselves are just great. Like when you can make a cave look cool, you know you're doing something right. As Star Ocean 2 does so well, they also take advantage of different camera angles for great effect. But yeah, so many of these are just a vibe though. One of my favorites is the Field of Love. I always like outdoor dungeons when you throw a floating island setting into it. Yeah, I'm all in. The final dungeon is also a vibe too. Some screens had me like, damn, this looks dope. You know what's not dope though? All the backtracking. After you complete a dungeon, there is no quick way to leave. There's no item to use, the game doesn't cut back to the entrance, you just literally gotta walk all the way back out. This honestly does kinda suck. You can set scouts to reduce the encounter rate, but I never really felt like this helped that much. Or at all, really. I kinda wonder if it's glitched, actually. I feel like I got more encounters sometimes using it. I also found it kinda weird that you don't even need to fight all the bosses and dungeons. 
I think you can skip the Cross K boss fight, and I know you can skip the fight in the Sanctuary of Linga. I know that, because I did. I walked outside and was like, wait, wasn't there a boss fight I remember? So, I went back in and, aha, here's where I need to go. It's pretty easy to miss, I guess, it just looks like a solid wall. I walked by here the first time and had no idea. I wonder if this was intentional or just a questionable artistic choice. I guess we'll never know. Earlier, I said there weren't too much puzzles and, well, that does not apply to the Cave of Trials. This is a big optional super dungeon and it's 13 floors deep. It can only be unlocked by reaching the final save point of the entire game, and it's like a true test of everything you know about Star Ocean 2. Each floor has its own gimmick, tough-ass monsters, and you even have to make use of your specialties. If you want to be a true master of Star Ocean 2, the game wants you to prove it. It takes like 5 plus hours to beat, and there are no save points. Thankfully, there are a couple exits throughout it though if you want to go back out and save. Look at what level I started the Cave of Trials, and look at what level I ended on. Yeah, crazy, right? Oh yeah, and as you can see, level 100 is not the max. Few JRPGs have levels beyond 100, so I always thought this was really cool. The satisfaction and psychological effect of seeing the numbers go that high is very real, especially compared to where you started the game. The sense of progression is just excellent. I think the max is 255. I've never gotten there before, but yeah, pretty wild stuff. Anyway, when we finally make it to the end of the 13th floor, we reach the Celestial Being. Gabriel Celesta? Yeah, it's supposed to be Gabriel, but I guess we got a mistranslation here. There were recurring super boss in many Tri-Ace games as recent as Star Ocean the Divine Force, and this is their first appearance. And as you can probably imagine, they are no joke. Victory is well earned, and upon doing so, you get this awesome triumphant track to place as you make your way back out with no random encounters. It's a very satisfying feeling. You know what's not a satisfying feeling though? Having a laptop that you're emulating and recording the game on stop working. <sighs> I've been having battery issues for a while now and unfortunately it finally crapped out for good. Because of this I wasn't able to transfer over my footage in time of me beating Gabriel Celesta, nor was I able to beat the other super boss, the Aselia Queen. Another recurring super boss in many Tri-Ace games that sometimes goes by the Ethereal Queen. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry guys, I'm really annoyed by this. I really wanted the bragging rights, but I wasn't about to restart a third playthrough just for that. Whenever I get around to playing the remake though, her ass is going down. Hell, I'm even gonna try her on higher difficulties. Oh yeah, let's talk about that real quick. There's Earth Mode, Galaxy, and Universe. Basically just normal, hard, and expert. Galaxy Mode is already pretty damn hard, but Universe? Yeah, you're gonna have to reach 255 to beat every boss. I believe in the remake you can switch difficulties whenever, but in the original you have to unlock them first. You do this by filling out a certain percentage of the voice collection. Man, I was going to play a lot of my favorite voice clips here, but unfortunately, my laptop died before I was able to record this part. They are uploaded to YouTube though, so you know what, let's just play a little bit of Clods. Or should I say, Crods. Crod has advanced forward. <laughs> He's got some of the best lines in the game anyway, so here's a little rabbit of fire, some of his gems. Oh, it's just them. The enemy. Stay focused. Things will work out. I think. Behind? First Knuckle, Dragon Howl, Sword Bomber, Mirror Slice, Tear into Pieces, Damn! Uh-oh, looks like we won, unexpectedly weak. Well, that's somewhere around 80 points. That was around 50 points. You think you can win over the Hero of Light? Pure 90s cheese in all the best ways, you gotta love it. I recommend checking out the other characters too, there are some extremely funny lines. What are some of your favorites? Let us know in the comments. Before I talk about the characters and my final thoughts on the plot, there's a few other things I want to mention real quick. In Fun City, there's this Cooking Master minigame and there's also these bunny races you can bet on. I didn't mess around with these too much, but I thought they were worth mentioning. Oh yeah, there is a Coliseum too, and I did mess around with that actually. There's some good prizes to be won. I like all the graphics for items in this game, and there is a shit ton. The food items especially are nice to look at. There's just something about food in video games, you know? Kinda weird, none of the special items have their own graphics, but all the common ones do. Usually it's the opposite. Speaking of little visual flares, I also like those personality bubbles above characters' heads at times. It's a fun way to show emotion. I especially like the little angry cloud one. Look how cute he is when he's mad. I probably should have mentioned this during the private action part, but I like how when you're leaving town after triggering one, your party will remind you where it is you're supposed to go. This prevents you from getting lost if you put down the game for a while. 
it's a nice touch. The writing and overall dialogue in this game is kind of a mixed bag. On the positive, it's not super stiff and robotic like some PS1 RPGs can be, it actually flows pretty well sometimes. However, there are some other moments that are just worded really awkwardly. It kind of feels like some stuff got Bill Murray and Scarlett Johansson. It's weird because some moments are written well, which just makes these instances more jarring. There's also the occasional typo. Pretty standard for PS1 RPGs though. Overall, I'd say the dialogue's not bad, it's not great, it's middle of the road. Let's finally talk plot and characters. So, I'm just gonna be honest. As amazing of an overall game Star Ocean 2 is, it does not have that great of a story. In fact, I'd maybe even say it's the weakest part about this game. I really love the premise and the idea of the story, but the execution leaves much to be desired. I don't think it's bad, but the overarching plot definitely isn't as interesting as the individual character moments. Credit given where it's due, Star Ocean 2 does do a great job of these. In the first disc, there's a lot of nice scenes where your party's just hanging out, chilling at the end. Like when Claude and Raina first get to cross, when Rain and Diaz are talking in Mars Village, all the scenes around the Tournament of Arms, and even moments like cozy nights at Celine's house and Bowman's house. These are the moments that stick with me, not really the grand narrative. I really wish more JRPGs would make more use of ends like this. Sometimes it's the moments of downtime that can help a journey feel like more of a, well, more of a journey. One of our earliest videos was about the coziness of ends in JRPGs, and Star Ocean 2 is a prime example of that. Unfortunately though, Disc 2 has very little of these moments, if any really. Compared to the first disc, it's a huge letdown in this regard. Anyway, that's kind of off topic. In the first disc, not even that much even really happens in terms of the grander plot. Not until the very end at least. My favorite part really has nothing even to do with the main story, the Tournament of Arms. This and the kidnapping in Mars are probably the two biggest parts of the game where Claude and Reyna's stories diverge the most. You get more narrative with Reyna and more gameplay with Claude. I prefer Claude in this scenario though, so you can actually fight in the tournament yourself. If you're playing as Reyna, you just watch him and yeah, not as fun. It is easier to make it to the final match though. If Claude loses one of his rounds, he gets a consolation match. This does not happen in his scenario. I also like how you have to shop around and find a sponsor. It makes a tournament feel like more of an event and not just some afterthought to check off a box. But yeah, as cool as this segment is, it has nothing to do with the main story. It gives us a lot of great character moments though, and that was kind of the point I was making earlier. I think these moments are way better than the actual plot, barring some exceptions that I'll touch on in a bit. You know how earlier I said some bosses and dungeons can just be straight up skipped? That's because from a narrative standpoint, there really isn't much reason to have bosses in the first disc. The main villains of the game don't even get introduced until the very end of disc 1. On one hand, this is nice setup for Disc 2. However, the problem is, in my opinion, it never fully delivers on that setup. Like the end of the disc is so epic and has so much potential. We find out that Reina is Nedian, her pendant is a quadratic key which has connections with the quadratic sphere, aka the sorcery globe. These mysterious ten wise men appear and beat the shit out of us, making us feel like fucking idiots. And the planet expel, like fucking explodes. Everything that was familiar is now gone. Like, even though nothing we do in the first disc really matters and there are no real villains, I can still let it slide knowing that it leads up to this. So why? Why does it not work, you ask? Well, if we're just going by the main story, disc 1 is twice as long as disc 2, and we now have 10 villains to flesh out on top of new characters. Yeah, I think you can see the issue here. Star Ocean Disc 2 is like the anti Xenogears Disc 2. It's really fun from a gameplay standpoint, but disappointing on a narrative level. I know I'm just not looking at this through the lens of an overly critical adult either. I remember even as a kid the overall story in Disc 2 disappointing me. Plus I played Wild Arms earlier this year and the second half of that game, and the whole ending for that matter, is amazing. Star Ocean 2's plot just lacks focus and tries to do too much in Disc 2 with not enough time to do it. It has a very interesting premise and there are some hard hitting moments, however the story is definitely not one that I would call deep on any level. Let's just say it probably won't be appearing on our RPGs with deep and mature story series. 
I've also played Breath of Fire 4 recently, and while I do think that one also suffers from a rushed second half, it still has some very mature moments that really made me think. Star Ocean 2 does have some intense, memorable scenes, but they're not really ones that make me think. They're more just like, oh damn, that sucks. Now I'm not saying a story needs to be super deep to be good, however when the plot feels rushed, isn't fleshed out that well, and doesn't make me think, yeah, it's kind of hard to appreciate the story that much. Take Grandia for example, it does not have a deep story by any means, but it's still very engaging to me because it's told well. I don't think Star Ocean 2's story is told well. I guess I could have saved the last few minutes and just said that, but that's not as fun. The characters in Star Ocean 2 are... Well, it kind of depends. We talk a main story, or we talk in private actions. I already touched on this earlier, so I won't harp on this too long. But yeah, characters in private actions? Awesome. Super charming. Tons of personality. Characters in the main story, besides Claude, Raina, Diaz, and Leon. Blander than the first time I ever tried cooking chicken and didn't use a speck of seasoning. Considering most characters are optional and it's hard for the game to plan around this as they don't know which ones you're actually going to have, I do get it and this is understandable. However, it also just shows an unfortunate flaw with this type of system. Chrono Cross suffers from a similar issue. After a character segment is done for the game, they're pretty much a non-factor after that. Even Diaz, who has a lot of screen time in Disc 1. On Disc 2, anyone that's not Claude and Reyna is completely irrelevant. We'll say a random line in conversations here and there, but these could be interchangeable by any one of them. They have no personality. Oh well, I guess when most of the cast is optional, this is what you get. Speaking of optional, while I respect it, I kind of hate how the game makes you choose between certain characters. You don't want to spend your life wondering what could have been. Sir, I need a decision. Uh, 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 uh. I already mentioned how you get Leon and Claude scenario and Diaz and Reyna's. However, this isn't the only example. You can also only get Bowman or Priestess and Ashton or Opera. Oh, and Ernest too. Neither Bowman or Priestess are in my in-game party, so while this does kind of suck, I can live with this. However, I hate having to choose between Ashton and Opera. They're both cool as hell and strong as shit. Regardless of who I choose on a playthrough, one of them is in my in-game party. On the bright side, this does encourage a lot of replayability. When I play as Claude, I go with him, Reyna, Selene, Ashton, Priestess, Leon, Noel, and Jasado. And when I play as Reyna, I go with her, Claude, Selene, Opera, Ernest, Bowman, Dias, and Jasado. This gives me four guys and four girls on each team, and two swordsmen on each team. It's a nice balance, I feel. I have done Claude, Diaz, and Ashton on the same team before though, and yeah, that is pretty fucking fun. The only thing I don't like about this setup is that you don't get all the races on one team. There's humans, Expellians, Needians, Tetragenes, and Felpools. You can only get all of them if you play as Claude and go with the opera route. Maybe I'll try this next time. I like having as diverse as parties as possible. On that note, I love the design of the cast. The original PS1 artwork is so unique and so damn good. In my opinion, it shits all over the PSP art. The new remake art looks to be pretty good in its own way. It's very detailed and stylized. Anyway, I want to talk about the individual characters themselves before I talk about the 10 wise men, the ending, and then my closing thoughts. I'll save Claude and Reyna for last so we can leave all the spoiler stuff for the end. The other characters won't have any late game spoilers because, well, we already discussed why. They pretty much don't exist in Disc 2. Let's talk Celine first. Gotta love her bio. A sexy treasure hunter looking for a boyfriend. Man, I can hear the sea of miladies echoing from here. Apparently, she only goes for chads though. Oh yeah, and I guess royalty as well, as there's a secret ending where she marries the Prince of Cross. Yeah, this is another thing I never knew about until now. Anyway, she's the first party member you come across in the game, and while she's not mandatory, the game does push you pretty heavily to take her. She joins you for Cross Cave, and you even have to go to her hometown and talk to her parents during the bandit kidnapping in Mars. It just feels weird not to bring her along. I've never not taken her. Plus, why would you not? She's strong as shit early game and helps immensely. As soon as I heard her yell out Energy Arrow, I knew that motherfucker was about to die. Uh -oh. Energy Arrow! Ha! I'm also a big fan of her design. It might even be my favorite in the game. I mean, I don't really know what the fuck she's wearing. She's got like a hula hoop with curtains on, but yeah, I don't know. It just looks cool. At the very least, it's super creative. I like the attention to detail too. All Expellian magic users need a heraldic crest to perform magic, which is kind of like a tattoo. We can very clearly see these on Selene. Overall, Selene's awesome. She's one of the first characters that comes to mind when I think of Star Ocean 2. Next up, we have Ashton. Man, I fucking love Ashton. 
He's another one that instantly comes to mind when I think of this game. The first full party I ever had was him, Claude, Rain, and Celine, so that always feels like the Star Ocean 2 party to me. I love his in-game sprite, but his actual artwork is... nah, it's kinda just okay to me. I get why he looks all nervous, but yeah, I don't know, just wish we could get different bows. The whole concept of him being cursed with the twin dragons on his back is just so unique and fun. I love how they all become homies and all their little banter. By the way, they will always be Giro and Rurun. None of that creepy, weepy bullshit from the PSP version. Anyway, personality-wise, he's just such a likable dude. He's obsessed with barrels for some reason, and according to his bio, he also likes sewing and heraldic fencing. And look at that, he also likes a nice girl with pure thoughts. He's just wholesome energy personified. I mean, listen to how happy he sounds in his in-game battle quotes. I'm so happy! I did it! Speaking of battles, Ashton is a fucking powerhouse, dude. Next to Claude, he probably has the best regular attack in the entire game. His killer moves aren't bad, but his normal attack just wrecks shit. It's so quick. Definitely a top tier character all around. Next is Opera, and yeah, we already know she kicks ass. She's like a cool three-eyed alien chick with a big ass gun, what's not to love? Awesome design, strong in battle, and her being one of the only two Tetra genes in the entire game just gives her this air of mystery and uniqueness. On a casual first time playthrough, she's also a lot harder to come across than Ashton is, which only adds to this. Like to get Ashton, all you have to do is talk to someone in Hurley, not in a private action either, get a lead about a dragon in the Salva Mines, go to the Salva Mines, and then voila, you got Ashton. To get Opera though, you have to trigger a specific private action and cross, not recruit Ashton, then after the Tournament of Arms, you have to trigger another private action, this time in Hilton, then you gotta go back to cross, talk to the king, he'll let you in the Mountain Palace, and then finally you can recruit Opera. Like an hindsight, it's not that much, but for the first time player, knowing to do all this and passing up on Ashton? Yeah, unless you had prior knowledge of her existence, I doubt too many players came across her naturally in the first playthrough. Probably why they decided to give her her own page in the manual. They were like, alright guys, we gotta at least give them a hint. Because I love Ashton so much, I didn't actually start experimenting around with her till later playthroughs. As a medium long range fighter, she has a lot of versatility. I don't know if it's her strongest killer move, but the one I use most often was Alpha on 1. It's like a homing missile type attack that shoots out even more shots at a higher proficiency. Very, very helpful. While I didn't make use of it on this playthrough, if she maxes out Healing Star, she can actually be a top tier healer as well. At higher difficulty modes, this can be very useful. I do have two nitpicks about her though. One, when she gets attacked in combat, she sometimes lets out this ghastly scream that kind of freaked me out the first time I heard it. Green Black. <laughs> Hearing this all game got kind of old by the end. I was kind of tempted to venture for Chisato late game, but I was like, nah, I've come too far, I'm too lazy to level her up. And two, she's got a green jacket on in her artwork, but not in the sprite. This obviously doesn't matter, but it does kind of bother me. Overall, Opera's another top tier character though. She makes a worthy addition to any in-game party. Alright, next we got Bowman. I feel like I want to like Bowman a lot more than I actually do. I really like the idea of him, an older married pharmacist trying to keep up with the young bucks. But dude, first of all, you're like 27, you're not that old, and honestly, the first time you meet him, he's kind of a dick. He acts all skeptical of our party and sends us on some fetch quest to like, prove our worth to him before he can help us, and it's like, broke, come on, I know you have nothing better to do right now anyway, there are literally zero customers in here. He's also one of the only characters that tries to join you in the main story, and honestly, I just feel bad taking him along. Like, dude, you got a wife. How did that conversation even go? Hey, honey, how was your day? Great, great. So these teenagers came by the shop earlier, and they're kind of going on this big adventure, and while they didn't directly ask me to go, it kind of sounds pretty fun. So, yeah, um, dinner's in the fridge. I'm probably going to be gone for a while. Uh, not sure when I'll be back next, but yeah, I'll see you when I see you. Even when you go back there later for private actions, he just makes up reasons not to go see her. I feel like Bowman secretly hates his wife and just wanted an excuse to leave. Also another example of the sprite not matching the artwork. In the art, he's got a white lab coat on, and in the in-game model, he does not. Battle-wise, I used to think he sucked, but it turns out he's actually kind of a fucking beast. With the right setup, his poison pills can just straight up sow the bosses. Next playthrough, I want to try him out more for sure. Let's talk Priestess next. First of all, I like her design. That big ass mechanical hand kind of reminds me of Mag Launcher from Evolution. With that said, why is she so small though? You ever realize in the group picture she's like half the size of most people? 
I mean, she's 16. Why is she over a foot shorter than Leon, who's supposed to be 12? Assuming the Star Ocean wiki is accurate, she's supposed to be 5'1", whereas Reyna is 5'3", so yeah. Whoever did this are definitely fucked up the proportions. In terms of personality, she's like your quirky, eccentric, happy-go-lucky teenage inventor. She's also got a bit of a flirtatious side as well, as her first interactions with Claude are pretty interesting, and she even has an ending with Reyna where they just hit on dudes together. I think my boy Ashton's got dibs though. Sorry, Leon. Battle-wise, I'm not gonna lie. I haven't used her that much. She's an okay mid-range fighter though. Not top tier, but not bottom either. I contemplated using her more in Claude's playthrough, but after using her in some battles, that battle voice... Yeah, off to the bench you go. I couldn't handle hearing that all game. However, who was an A-team starter for me was our man of few words, Dias. He is kind of an asshole, but I've always had a soft spot for stoic swordsmen with cool designs. On that note, we got another case of the artwork not matching the sprite. His undershirt in the art is a lot more green, whereas in the game it's more of a bluish teal. His hair also goes from blue to a really light blue, borderline white. I like his actual design, but I feel like his expression looks a little... kinda lame? I think his art in blue sphere looks a lot cooler and much more fitting of the type of dude he is. Besides Claude and Reyna, Dias might get the most screen time out of any other character in Disc 1. The first time you meet him is at Mars during the bandit kidnapping and... Yeah, he's not the friendliest of dudes. However, as big of an asshole as he is, he was a childhood friend of Reyna's and you can tell that he does care for her. More in a big brother, little sister type way. Claude does not realize this though and Max super jealous. So much so that your party even splits in half during this segment. Dias has this like super savage and merciless attitude towards the bandits and it's like, damn dude, let's calm down a bit and bandits like kill your parents or something. Oh. Yeah, that makes sense. We don't see this flashback until later, but I do like how we get a reason for why Dias hates Bandit so much and why he's so emotionally closed off. The next time we see him is at the Tournament of Arms, and I love how invincible the game makes him seem here. You get to watch his battles, and he's using these combat techniques like blocking and parrying, and he's just untouchable. Plot-wise, Dias is supposed to be a much more skilled swordsman than Claude at this point, and the game really hammers that in. Or swords it in, I guess, as when you fight him in the final round, he straight up slices and dices your ass. Claude is not even a match. When he joins your party at the front lines five hours later though, well, he might as well be that wooden pull in my basement when I was 10 years old as that bitch got hit hard by a nerf gun. Classic JRPG trope. Anyone that once kicked your ass and later joined you will no longer possess those same ass kicking abilities. Dias is still a strong fighter, just not the unstoppable force he once was. I like how him and Claude become all buddy-buddy after he joins you and Claude's all pumped. It's a good sign of maturity and growth and shows that they both come to respect each other. If you're playing as Claude though, this does not happen. Reyna makes a comment about how she feels this will be the last time we ever see Dias and, well, she's right about that. Honestly, on Claude's playthrough, it's a pretty unsatisfying arc. You never get to see any of his best moments really. There's a certain scene in Reyna's playthrough that turns him into probably my favorite character in the game. You see, Dias might be a selfish asshole, but he is not a dumb selfish asshole. He is very aware of his flaws and has no problem admitting them to Reyna. I mean, he straight up tells Reyna that Claude is the type of dude that would do anything to protect someone, whereas he himself just isn't. Because of this, he also tells her, Yeah, you're in safer hands with him than me. He can protect you better than I can. And you should stay by him. Now, just being aware of your shortcomings doesn't make you exempt from criticism, but I can at least respect the honesty, especially because it's coming from a place of wanting what's best for Reyna. I also like the whole thing about him always marching into battle because he loathes himself as a result for being the only survivor and not being able to protect his family. Overall, I just feel like he's more of a complex, layered character than he initially lets on. In terms of battle, I actually found Dias to be kind of underrated, as weird as that sounds. I feel like back in the day, I always used to hear about how strong he was because he was all cool and mysterious, and you could only get him on Reyna's playthrough. However, I feel like this narrative shifted over time to where people were like, nah, he's actually pretty overrated and way behind Claude and Ashton. Well, he is and he isn't. Let me explain. First things first, his regular attack is god awful. It's fucking trash. It's so slow. Slow enough that you can barely get any attacks off half the time as enemies just stun you. In second evolution, and I'm assuming the remake as well, this was fixed, but yeah, in the PS1 version, it straight up sucks. With that said, none of this matters as you should not be using normal attacks with Dias. Dias was put on this planet for one purpose and one purpose only. To perform Air Slash. Now, some of you might be thinking, 
Well, Claude is their slash too, and that kind of sucks. But let me tell you, Dios is their slash is fucking S grade. It's like 10 times as fast for one. It can just mow down enemies across the battlefield. It almost turns them into like a long range sniper instead of a close range melee fighter. It's not super powerful, but it costs like no MP to you, so you can spam it constantly. It allows them to play it very safe and just chip away from a distance. On a casual playthrough, this may not matter as much, but for the optional super bosses and on higher difficulty modes, this is extraordinarily useful. He'll just post up in the back, safely dishing out 9,999 damage every few seconds. His raw DPS may not be quite as high as Claude or Ashton's, however, if you want consistent, less risky damage that doesn't require you to be in the front lines the whole time or you can easily die, Diaz is your guy. Okay, I spent way too long talking about Diaz, but yeah, he's just a pretty memorable character to me. Last thing I'll say, while this would be fixed in subsequent versions in the PS1 version, he has no private actions. Yeah, kinda sucks. Oh well, still love the guy. If you're playing as Claude though, instead of getting Diaz, you instead get Leon. Leon is... okay. He's probably the best spellcaster in the game, but that's not saying much. As I mentioned earlier, they just get massively outclassed late game. Like why would you want to pause the game every 10 seconds with an unskippable animation when you can just do like 5 times the amount of damage in the meantime with regular attacks? You can make spellcasters viable, but why would you want to? They just waste your time. Anyway, in terms of design, Leon is a Felpool, the only one in the game. Felpools are humanoid species with cat-like qualities. While a lot of characters from the first game are Felpool, that was on a different planet, Rogue. For the longest time, this made me confused. Why is a Felpool on Expel? I guess there's this private action with Noble Lay game where we find out that Felpools are ancestors of Expellians, and there's this rare recessive gene that can cause genetic mutations turning people into Felpools. This is why Leon has cat ears and his parents do not. Kinda weird this is never explained in the main game, but okay. When it comes to personality, Leon's like your stereotypical, bratty, egotistical, genius whiz kid. He's a little insufferable at first, but he warms up to your party later on. I feel like he starts calling Claude and Raina big brother and sister kind of quickly though. Like dude, you were a dick to me an hour ago, now all of a sudden I'm big bro? I mean you are 12 I guess, so it's fine. I will say though, him and Claude do have a really nice scene together after we get our asses kicked by Shin and he presumably loses his parents. Claude just out here slapping the shit out of little kids. The enemy! Yeah! Overall, I think Leon's an okay character. Not my favorite, but not my least favorite either. Next we got Ernest, and Ernest is, uh... Well, he's certainly there, alright? This dude does not do much. Given that he's the most obscure and hardest character to recruit without a guide, this makes sense. You can only recruit him after recruiting Opera, who already has a lot of steps to get. Little warning though, if you do do the extra step to get him, just make sure you really want him. If you say no when he tries to join, Opera will go with him and leave your party. Ernest is another character that I want to like a lot more than I actually do. He's 35 years old and is like this cool, suave looking archaeologist. However, maybe I just didn't see the right private actions with him because I feel like he has like, no personality. I feel like most times I try to talk to him in private actions, he was really rude and just told me to like, go away. Well, that's gonna be your attitude, thanks for the battle suit, Tommy. Okay, well I guess the one thing I know about him is he was often at the bars drinking with Opera. During private actions, this was a common occurrence. I don't know, this whole vibe and style, I'm kinda getting the whole, hey, me and my girlfriend saw you from across the bar, you're pretty cute, would you like to join us for a drink? Type thing from, hey, no hate if that's your thing, I just wish we at least would've got something. As it is, he feels pretty hollow. I feel like he could've been this cool, Han Solo, Spike Spiegel-like character, but yeah, he's just not. He's also got this like, gold trim on his jacket and the character is sprite, but it is not there in the artwork. Man, Star Ocean 2 is really bad with this, I never realized it. When it comes to battle, I'm not gonna lie, I have little experience with Ernest. He uses whips though, and seems to be very average, if that. In fact, I think he's commonly considered to be one of the worst characters in the game. This just makes his character even more of a letdown. He's like twice the age of the cast and has a cool design, so it just sucks there's not much reason to actually use him. Overall, he's wasted potential I feel. Hopefully in the remake, he becomes a little bit more viable. Alright, next we got the most forgettable character in the entire game, Noel. Don't believe me? Dude, look at the official artwork. Notice anything missing? If you try to play a Where's Water game with Noel, you'd be looking for a while. Or you'd be looking forever, actually, as he's just straight up not here. Yeah, they totally forgot about this dude. Just setting the standard for everyone else, I guess. I literally never use this guy, and the only thing I know about him is that he likes animals. Oh yeah, and he has two houses, too. After I get him, he warms a bench so hard I could fry some eggs on that bitch. He's the last character you get, and there's just not a reason to use him over Reyna. Also, his hair in the artwork is more of a brown, whereas in the game, it's more of a dirty blonde. 
Okay, I gotta know. What came first? The Sprite or the art? These, like, never match. Anyway, not much else to say about this dude. The fact that his own game forgot him tells you all you need to know. Next, we got Jasada. I'm not gonna lie, as a kid, I never really liked her that much, but now, as an adult, yeah, Jasada's awesome. She's a gun-wielding, martial artist, news reporter. Like, what's not to love? Well, okay, maybe her outfit, I guess. I don't know, I'm just not a huge fan. I'm kind of getting flat attendant mixed with the schoolboy vibes. Uh, plus again, a blue shirt on the sprite and a black shirt on the artwork. Come on, Star Ocean 2. Her blue sphere art, though? Now that's a news reporter. When it comes to battle, while I didn't use her on this playthrough, she's basically the DPS queen of Star Ocean 2. Tear gas absolutely wrecks shit and is one of the best moves in the entire game. This move alone makes her a viable addition at any in-game party. Yes, even against the optional super bosses and on higher difficulty modes. She's that good. Overall, I'd say her biggest downfall as a character isn't even really her fault. You just get her too late in the game. Just a bit ago, I mistakenly said that Noble was the last character you can recruit, but... Yeah, it's actually Jasada. You get her like three-fourths of the way through the game, which is just way too late for most people to want to invest into her. I know as a kid, I never used her for this reason. This kind of hampers her a bit in the personality department as well. She doesn't get as many private actions as most others because of this. Though I will say, she does get a really important one regarding the Ten Wise Men, so there's that. The only things I really know about her is that she's passionate, hardworking, and a little quirky. All in all, she's a fine character. She's amazing in battle, I just wish she got some more screen time. Okay, and that brings us to our final two characters, Claude and Reyna. After I talk about them, I'm going to talk about the Ten Wise Men for a bit in the ending as well, so there will be lacking with spoilers from here on out. If you would like to avoid all this and just skip to my closing thoughts, go ahead and skip to the timestamps on screen. We good? Alright, let's go. Let's talk Claude first. So, on this most recent playthrough, I did grow a new appreciation for him, but with that said, I still think he's a pretty mediocre protagonist, if I'm being completely honest, in terms of likability at least. I feel like he doesn't really have that much of a personality. Like the manual says, he's good at troublemaking and running late, and that he likes all kinds of food, and it's like... I guess? I don't recall a single time in the game he was ever late, and the only time he causes trouble is the very beginning when he touches that mysterious object. Then about the whole loving food thing, there's that one quick bit about him eating Raina's mom's feast and that's pretty much it. Doing something once doesn't make that a personality trait. It's like your friends introducing you to people all like, Oh yeah, this guy, such a rascal, little tardy troublemaker, always getting into shenanigans. Dude, I was late to class one time in like 7th grade, not really. He's like your classic do-gooder type that would do anything to protect those he cares about. Admirable quality, sure. However, that doesn't really make him that... Fun. As I mentioned earlier in the video as well, he's also just super jealous towards Reyna. On one hand, I get it. He's a 19 year old kid that was just separated from everything he's ever known and loved. It's only natural he would feel a certain connection towards the first person he would meet on this foreign planet, especially a cute girl that happens to be around his age. With that said though, dude, Reyna has known Diaz for her entire life and you've known her for like a week. Chill out a bit. Homie's down bad in some scenes. He's also pretty sensitive and a bit desperate in others. This actually makes him pretty realistic as a teenager. I can respect this writing choice around him, but that doesn't mean that I have to really like him. I can see why others would though, he is written appropriately for his age. However, all this being said, he does have some really good moments that I really do like. I think his best moment comes near the end of disc 1. A little context first though. It seems like Claude really doesn't want to follow in his famous military father's footsteps. It says this in the manual, and certain scenes even hint at this in-game. 
Anyway, near the top of Illyria Tower, since we're so high up, Clot's transmitter finally starts getting signal again. I can't remember if I mentioned this earlier, but yeah, previously, Clot could never get signal on his transmitter, so he can never reach out back to his dad. With the signal now working again though, Claude's dad and the rest of the crew find a way to teleport him back up to the ship. This should be the end of the game, right? Claude finally found his way home. GG, that's a wrap. Well, actually, no. Claude does not want to be here. He's like, dude, what the hell are you doing? Send me back, my friends are in trouble. His dad and the other guy are of course like, no, we can't do that, and they kind of have this back and forth for a bit. A short moment later, we actually find out the Sorcery Globe is about to collide with Expel. Claude was in panic mode already, and this obviously sets him off even more. He demands to get sent down there again, they say no, so he says, okay, at least let me go say goodbye to my friends. Dad, you had battle comrades once too, you know what it's like. Ooh, right in the feels, memories of the first Star Ocean probably flashing back over Rhinixus right now. To the surprise of everyone else around him, he understands and grants his request. Cut back to our party. After waiting for over two hours, Claude finally comes back. He says he'll explain what happened later, and I'll let the scene play out a bit so you can understand the feel. To me, this might just be the best moments in the entire game. Claude's journey is officially over as he's found his home. The lack of music here really plays a vital part in helping this scene hit hard. I mean, given what Claude knows about the planet about to be destroyed, it's kind of dumb as hell. But for video game logic, I can respect it, you know they're gonna find a way to make it work. Even the scene after it is really good. Ronixis is all, okay, we gotta send a team back down there to go get Claude. To which his right hand officer pretty much says, is that really a good idea sir? The planet could be in danger even sooner, there's no guarantee he'd even agree to go back. It's kind of a suicide mission. He's very clearly made up his mind already. Ronixus has to take a step back and be like, damn he's out of line but he's right. I feel really bad for his dad here, that's not an easy decision to make. Anyway, this is kind of the end of Claude's narrative. If disc 1 is all about Claude's journey, disc 2 is all about Raina's journey. The only moment Claude really gets in the second disc is when the wise men destroy Ronix's ship and everyone with it. Okay, this is an intense scene though. There's a lot of FMV showing it happening and they're interjected by Claude's understandable emotional reaction and you really feel for him here. Poor Ronixus though, dude died also thinking his son was dead. And Star Ocean 2 was not kind to his character. Okay, let's briefly talk about Claude in battle before we move on to Reyna. We'll keep it pretty quick, Claude is probably the best character in the game, at least top 2 or 3 minimum. I mainly use Ted Splitter and Twin Slash, but his best moves are probably more like Ripper Blast, Dragon Howl, and Sword Bomber. In fact, for most of the end game, I was just using his regular attack. With the Slayer's Ring and Eternal Sphere combo, he's like a multi-hitting god. So yeah, overall, Claude in battle, S tier for sure. Claude in the actual game though, eh, kinda more C tier for me if I'm being honest. His design is pretty cool though, I am a fan. I don't think he's bad, but I do prefer Reyna. Speaking of, let's talk about Reyna. First of all, love her design. I kinda get like Sailor Moon or Card Captor Sakura vibes, it's awesome. Big fan of her Blue Sphere design as well. Her second evolution design though, into the trash it goes. Also, what's up with her bio in the manual? Likes things that are cute, dislikes things that are not cute. I was trying to think of a joke to put here, but sometimes the humor writes itself. I do still like her personality in game, but I gotta be honest, maybe not quite as much as before. I came down on Claude for being too jealous, well I could also come down on Reyna for not communicating well at all. Like in the Tournament of Arms, yeah Claude jumped the gun on assumptions, but it would have taken Reyna like maybe 20 seconds to explain the misunderstanding. This is an age old trope in movies and TV shows, but yeah that doesn't mean I'm a fan. With that said, some of this can just be chalked up to teens being teens. I mean what teenagers do you know that communicate well? Probably very few, if any. This is all fine I guess, it's just some other lines that I take issue with. Like she makes this comment to Gamgee's granddaughter where she says, 
Okay, you guys cheer for Diaz. I can't because I have to cheer for Claude. Like, no, no, don't cheer for Claude because you feel like you have to. Cheer for him because you want to. And if you don't want to cheer for him, that's fine. You've known Diaz for way longer and Claude will just have to get over that. This whole segment really doesn't have a satisfying end either as the awkward tension is never really resolved. This makes it even more jarring that five hours later, Rain is dropping lines like, Oh Claude, I can't live without you. Where did this come from? I mean, yeah, I get they just escaped death, but still, this seems very sudden. Especially because no major scene from the Tournament of Arms to now really happens between them. I feel like this might have fit better later in the game in like the Herald Your Weapons Lab or something. As it is though, these are still some pretty cool scenes. So, the planet that we're on in the second disc, Energy Need, is actually like an artificial planet created by the original Need billions of years ago. It was the most powerful and technologically advanced place in the entire galaxy. On Energy Need, Reyna's real mom, Rima, was a director at the Heraldry Weapons Laboratory. Unfortunately, due to some experiment going haywire, the lab and everyone there was destroyed. Everyone except little Reyna, that is. With the power of science and some space-time continuum shit, Rima finds a way to transport Reyna to safety. One slight problem though, it was 700 million years into the future. Needless to say, this is quite the shock to Reyna. She runs off to her place of comfort, the forest outside the lab. This bears an extremely strong resemblance to the Shingo forest and now it all makes sense why she likes spending so much time there. It reminded her of her childhood. Earlier I mistakenly said the Venerable Forest track only plays at the very beginning of the game and well, I was wrong. It plays here too. Very fittingly so, I might add. Her and Claude have a little heart to heart and Claude actually has some good insight here. Raina asks him if he thinks her mom really loved her and he says, yes, she loved both you and her career. My mom was the same, however, that doesn't mean they loved us any less. It's some good stuff. This effectively marks the end of Raina's narrative journey. She found out the truth about her real mom and now that's all that's left for her to do is for her to return home like she said at the beginning of the game. Now, some of you might be asking, Wait, wasn't Expel destroyed? Yes, it was, but with the power of some more technical jargon that I don't really need to get into, it's possible to bring it back. We gotta take out the 10 wise men first though, so let's talk about them. No, oh yeah, Reyna in battle. Godly healer and absolutely required for casual playthrough, but maybe could be replaced by opera for post-game stuff and on higher difficulties. Alright, now the wise men. I really, really like the concept of them, but the execution, I'm not too crazy about. I already explained how a 10 hour disc 2 isn't nearly enough time for 10 villains to have as big of an impact as they could have had. However, even how the game goes about it, I just don't think was handled that well. I think my biggest problem with them is that we learn very little about them through the main story. Most of what we learn about them is through completely optional content that we don't need to engage with at all. All that we learn about them through the main story is that billions of years ago, these gods 10 wise men wanted to rule the universe. They were eventually defeated by the Needians and trapped in eternity space where time stands still. That's basically it. We don't even learn all their names. Narl tells us that Indalesia was their leader, Cyril is his right hand man, and oh yeah, there's also this guy named Decus. Yeah, captivating stuff. After they were sealed away, apparently this Dr. Lantis suggested that Needians were too powerful and advanced for their own good and needed to be sealed off from the rest of the galaxy. We find out a little about this through Narl, but most of it is learned from the North City Library, which is completely optional. Like, look at all this important info we find out through plot dumps a lot of players might not even read. In my opinion, this is not a good design choice. Also, what's up with some of this text anyway? The ten wise men in a very unwise way began to flaunt their great strength? Like, who wrote this? If it was a person saying it, that'd be one thing, but this is official documentation here. However, with that said, some of the stuff we learn here isn't even accurate. There are some secret documents that can't be accessed, so that's pretty fishy. During a private action with Chisada, we find out there may be some more information lurking beneath the surface here. Later in the game, we can do a side quest that lets us gain access to these secret files. We come to learn that the Ten Wise Men are actually these humanoid weapons created by Dr. Lantis to fend off outside forces. The specialty of each Wise Men is described, though very briefly. Before he was able to finish all of them, his daughter and last remaining family member, Philia, was unfortunately killed in an outside attack. He eventually caught wind of this and basically went mad locking himself up in the lab. He then changed the function of the wise men and now programmed them to destroy the world instead. He lets them out to wreak havoc and cause chaos while he works on his final creation, Indalesia. After some time, the Nidian forces chase the wise men back to the lab. Dr. Lantis then kills himself and transfers his consciousness into Indalesia. Then it was actually him that trapped them all in eternity space knowing that one day they'd be able to make it out. Need decided to cover all this up and keep it a secret. 
This is why the official documentation does not match the actual truth. So yeah, this is all pretty cool. I do like the lore here. The problem is though, most first time players will not know any of this. If you just go by the main story, all you know is that the 10 wise men are just these 10 strong ass dudes that want to take over the world for no reason. On one hand, I kind of like the secrecy of it all and how you have to go out of your way to discover it on your own. The fact that most of the government doesn't even know about it really gives you this feeling of digging up information you're not supposed to know. However, without all this knowledge, the second disc is really disappointing on a narrative level. This is why I was so underwhelmed with the story even as a kid. I get why some could like this, but I just don't think it's a good idea to put this important story info behind optional content. I'm a big fan of villain groups, so I wanted to love them, but ultimately they just show up too late in the game and don't get enough screen time to make up for it. Other awesome villains from the PS1 like the Quarter Knights from Wild Arms and all the villains from Xenogears show up constantly throughout the game, so when you finally beat them, it's really satisfying. A more one-to-one -one comparison would be Odessa from Wild Arms 2. They're also only in about half the game, however, they make far better use of that time as you see them a lot more. Plus, we're only dealing with 5 people here over 10. As I always say, quality over quantity. So yeah, love the idea of the 10 wise men, it's just the execution wasn't quite there for me. No well, it is what it is. Finally hunting them all down one by one is fun as shit though. First we got Marsilio and yeah, we kick his ass. Next up we got Shigio and yeah, we kick his ass too. Third is Burl and I'll let you take a guess what we did to him. I like how he tries to gain the moral high ground before the fight and is all like, oh you guys are no different than us, you've taken countless lives too. And it's like, not really dude, I mean we've killed monsters I guess, but you guys are out here straight up murking intelligent species. We are not the same bro, totally undeserved line. Very deserving death though. The next battle, the difficulty spikes up quite a bit. Instead of fighting one at a time, we're now fighting three. Rupert, Gibral, and Nicholas. Oh yeah, real quick, in future versions, the Ten Wise Men are named after Archangels. In Second Story though, they're named after like Saints and Scholars and Bishops instead. The whole Archangel thing does make more thematic sense with God's Ten Wise Men, but I don't know. I kind of like the uniqueness and variety of these. I also like how they have to introduce themselves here because we don't even know their names yet. You see what I was talking about earlier? Learning someone's name two minutes before you kill them is not how you create a memorable villain. Because there are three of them though, they are pretty hard. I did die here. This is when I had to craft the Eternal Sphere and get the Slayer's Ring. After this, they were pretty much toast. After we beat them, someone remarks that's six down and Claude says there are four left. Good job Claude, you can count. Next up we got Decus and Vesper and okay, this might be the hardest fight in the entire game. At least on a casual playthrough. These dudes do not fuck around. Especially Decus, dude's voice actor hammed it up to the highest degree. This needs to be appreciated, you have to hear this. Here's a substitute for a greeting. Don't you think I'm very strong? I will warm you up to your bones. Oh, it's so hot I'm going to die. Hey, it's hot. Ah! <laughs> Wait, play that last one again. What the hell? How does a human being make this sound? I first heard this at like 3 a.m. and it caught me so off guard I replayed it back like five times and I started laughing to tears. I like how all the comments are everyone appreciating the greatness that is his performance. Wait, what is this link? Let's check it out. Decus raps. <laughs> Okay, dude, this is like what the internet was made for. Say what you want about it, but when it gives us gems like this, we gotta take a step back and appreciate how lucky we are. This needs to be preserved in some like musical society of excellence. Oh yeah, as far as the actual battle goes, it's hard as shit, I died like 5 times. I'm sure these guys walled many a player back in the day. I like how after we beat him, Dekas is all, oh, so you think you can beat us? Dude, I just did, what the hell is wrong with you? Deck is the type of dude to lose a race and be like, oh yeah, so you think you're faster than me, huh? Just out here gold medal in mental gymnastics. The second to last Wiseman we have is Cyril, or Cyril, whatever. I guess he's happy that we killed everyone else? 
Yeah, I guess that he planned on turning on Indalesio and wanted to rule the world himself. We never really learn why, so it's kind of missed potential here, I feel, but oh well. Battle-wise, he's pretty easy too. Since it's just him solo, he's a lot more manageable than the last fight. This now brings us to the last of the ten wise men, the one and only, Indalesio. Or should I really say, Dr. Lantis. Or I guess I actually shouldn't say, as even if you do this side quest, no one addresses this. Instead, we just get some short, generic speech about not needing anyone else to destroy the universe. Honestly, it's a little disappointing. There is a reference to Philia near the end though, and I imagine for the players that didn't do this side quest, they're probably like... who? However, if you take off his limiter, all this dialogue changes. What's his limiter, you ask? Okay, let's take it back all the way to the first five hours of the game, right before Click got destroyed. If you do a private action, you'll see this mysterious girl who tries to warn everyone that a natural disaster is about to hit. To a lot of players, this probably seemed pretty random. Who is this girl and how did she know this? Well, once you make it to the final save point of the game, you can trek all the way back out and then trigger a private action in Central City where you'll run into Philia again. This private action will not trigger unless you do the click one first, which is easily missable. She actually introduces herself this time and then asks if we remember her from click. She then asks us to kill her before her father, Dr. Lantis, swallows her consciousness? Yeah, it's a little confusing, but earlier it's hinted at that after she died, he found a way to transfer her consciousness into an artificial life form that he created. Anyway, before we're able to do anything, she vanishes. If you take on Indalesio after this scene, you'll then see him with her right before he kills her. The party will address him as Dr. Lantis this time, and then he tells us that Philia acted as like a limiter on his power. And with her now gone, his final form can be reached. Overall, the talk about torturing us and stuff is just a way more menacing speech. It's not just all talk either, he backs it up. With the limiter off, no exaggeration, he's three times as harder as he normally is. It turns him into the hardest super boss of the game and maybe the hardest final boss in any JRPG ever. With his limiter on, I beat him in the low 80s, but with it off, you have to be over 200. I was planning on doing this, but yeah, you guys already know the story about how my laptop died. It's pretty funny though, despite being perhaps the most powerful entity in the entire universe, since you're so high level at that point, Claude will still say, I'm coming. It's just them. I'm coming. Man, what an absolute legend. Anyway, even with his limiter on, he's no joke. I did die a few times. I'd be stun locking the hell out of him, only for him to break free and start massacring everyone. The tables would turn very quickly. I didn't really do anything different to beat him though, I just did the same thing and eventually got lucky enough that he didn't escape. They say the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result and, well, that's pretty much what I did. You see what I meant earlier when I was talking about how combat didn't have the most death as long as you had the right setup? This is a great example. Upon defeating him, Indalesio says this. Yes, thank you for stopping me. No need to put the light out yet. Are you hurt? Hey! Yes. Leave it up to me. Whew. I don't know why he says this, because in the scene immediately after, he has no regrets and says the universe is still going to be destroyed. No oh well. Our friends Narl and Mirage then show up and instruct us on what to do. I didn't explain this earlier, but yeah, there's like this crest of annihilation that can destroy the universe, but if it's counteracted with the crest of enchantment, it can stop it, I guess? Yeah, I don't know, the specifics aren't that important. So, we do just that, and Alessio realizes he failed, then he dies. It still looks like things aren't officially over yet though. We come to learn that even though the universe will be saved, energy need will not. I mean, if the universe isn't going to blow up, something still has to. We're told not to worry though, as apparently this will bring back the spell of the past and we'll be transported there on some space-time continuum shit. We then ask, well, can't you guys and the rest of the Needians come with us? Narl says no, we've come to the realization that a living creature that has stopped evolving is not worth existing. This is our fate that we made ourselves, and we have to accept it. Earlier, I said that Star Ocean 2 doesn't have that deep of a story that makes you think, and, well, this is probably the one exception. With that said, I don't know why Mirage and Naro don't come when they're still cool with Rain and Chisato coming. 
Oh yeah, same with Noel too, but I didn't get him on this playthrough, so yeah, homie's dying. We then say our goodbyes and away we go. We're now treated to a cool CGI cutscene involving energy need being destroyed and expel, well, being the opposite of that. Some time passes by and the game then cuts over to every character's ending. This is where the affection system comes into play. Each character can be paired up with someone, or they'll just have their own solo ending. There's over 80 possible endings, it's really cool. Calling them endings might be a bit of a stretch though, they're really just 30 to 60 second scenes, plus you get like 4 to 8 of them per playthrough. Don't get me wrong, they're still cool, just maybe not what you have in mind when you hear the term ending. But yeah, they're all on YouTube, I recommend checking them out if interested. There are some very interesting pairings you would not expect to see. Oh yeah, shout out to the music that plays during this part as well. I absolutely love this track. So chill. Anyway, I'll let the rest of these scenes play out as I compensate a bit. We already saw Chisato's ending, and yeah, her solo ending's pretty boring. She's just by herself and Hurley plotting her next move. Ernest's solo ending is okay. He's exploring the planet that Claude was at at the very beginning of the game. Nice full circle moment here. Okay, Opera has a really cool solo ending here, mainly because we get a new backdrop we've never seen before and it looks awesome. It really makes me want to explore her planet, it looks so high tech and futuristic. As much as I love this series, I really wish we would get more settings like this instead of the usual backwater medieval planet. Anyway, she's basically just reminiscing on her journey to her Batman Alfred Butler. Our man Diaz is at the Shingo Forest visiting the grave of his sister. Simple, poignant, effective. Bowman's solo ending has him back at his pharmacy. He's visited by Keith who tells him that he finished translating the ancient text from all the way back in disc 1. I used to think this was a dropped plot thread, but yeah, I guess it's concluded here. It ends up just being some history about need, which Bowman is quite familiar with, you could say. Celine's solo ending has her treasure hunting because, well, she's a treasure hunter. I guess I didn't realize I got six solo endings on this playthrough, my bad guys. Fortunately, that is not the same for Claude and Reina though. While I didn't get their relationship ending, I did get their friendship one. It just has Claude living with Reina and Arlia. To me, this is Vidic. At the beginning of the game, Reina did say she would return home one day and Claude also said that his home was with her. Their relationship ending has him working back in the Galactic Federation and it's like... Wait, I thought he didn't like that. I thought his whole narrative journey was him forging his own path and now he's right back where he started? I mean, I guess he has Reyna now, but the game makes it seem like he doesn't want to follow in his dad's footsteps, so it just seems weird for him to do just that. I think it's like the canonical ending too as it leads into Blue Sphere. I don't know if I agree with it, but hey, it is what it is. Reyna's pregnant though, so 
yeah, that escalated quick. Anyway, regardless of the ending you get for Claude Arena, this is how Star Ocean 2 officially ends. We get some absolutely awesome music here combined with some really cool CGI shots. This was not in the PSP version, and I'm guessing it's not in the remake either, so it remains unique to the PlayStation. It's a super dope vibe, so we're just gonna play it out here. If you don't want to watch it, feel free to skip to my closing thoughts on the next chapter. For those that do want to watch it, sit back and enjoy the show.
The Star Ocean, the second story. What an incredible game. It can always be a bit of a risk replaying childhood favorites as you're not quite sure how they might hold up. And while you could say that some mechanics are a little bit dated by modern standards, none of this detracted from the fun I had. From start to finish, Star Ocean 2 was just an incredibly fun time. The main game only took about 35 hours or so, which is a pretty good sweet spot for me. Like in most other RPGs from around this era, they always have at least one part or two that I dread on replays. As much as I really love the games, Breath of Fire 3 and 4 are kinda bad with this. In Star Ocean 2 though, no such part exists. The Field of Might was kind of annoying I guess, but it really wasn't that bad. Every single session, I was always excited for. That's not something I can say about every retrospective we've made. In fact, I think I did have the most fun with this game out of any other retrospective, at least tied for the top. It's so weird too because in our original Star Ocean video, I remember saying that was the least amount of fun I've had with the retrospective. The glow up between entries is just crazy. Now I'm sure there are some that prefer the first Star Ocean, but I am not one. I really can't think of a single aspect that game does better. I think Star Ocean 2's biggest strengths lie in its beautiful visuals, the awesome music, the amazing atmosphere, its diverse cast of characters, its really cool setting and premise, the super fun, albeit super spammy battle system, and just the way all the really ambitious systems like the skills, the private actions, the item creation, the affection all tie into each other. It almost shouldn't work as well as it does, but it does. There's truly no other game quite like it out there. With that said, it's not perfect though, it does have some flaws. Most notably the execution of its story, the villains, and the overall writing. I would also say character development and the main story as well. Like it's cool that you can beat the game with just Claude and Reyna and say no to literally everyone else, but it also means outside of their introductions, other characters don't really get any moments. I think games like Suikoden handle this better because while there are a lot of optional characters, there's also a required group of core characters that automatically accompany you sometimes. This keeps numerous characters relevant and important. Man, shouts to Suikoden. I still would consider Star Ocean 2 to be a top 5 or 6 RPG on the PlayStation, but aspects like this does hold it back from being like a top 3 to me. However, with that said, it has gotten me to reevaluate my priorities a bit. Story is still very, very important, but ultimately, I'm playing games to have fun. Star Ocean 2 helps show me that I don't need an amazing story to still really enjoy an RPG. I mean, it definitely helps, and most of my top favorites do still have amazing stories, but as long as I'm vibing with the atmosphere and the gameplay, I'm probably going to have a good-ass time. Star Ocean 2 is just a good-ass time. I think that's the biggest praise I can give a video game. Many RPGs come and go, but few leave a lasting impression like this one does. It's one of those games that doesn't come around too often, one where you can clearly see all the love and passion seeping from every facet. When you combine heart, charm, and ambition, you get a magical result. Triace may not always be the most consistent developer, but for this one, they absolutely knocked it out of the park. Or should I say the galaxy? No, the universe. Or better yet, the star ocean. Thanks, Triace. Alright, and that finally wraps up this video. Holy shit, that was a long one. Our first two hour video, so that's certainly something. Two hours later. If you enjoyed it, it would mean a lot if you could either hit that like button or subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. How do you guys feel about Star Ocean 2? And have you played the remake yet? Let us know in the comments below. Man, it feels good to get this one out because I'm not gonna lie, working on this video was not a very smooth process. I already explained how my laptop died, which is why some audio parts sound different, and then I also got sick for like a week and couldn't record, also why I probably sound a little stuffy in some parts. And on top of this, our editing software was having problems with this video for some reason to where it frees up for like 30 seconds to a minute between a lot of edits. When editing a 2 hour video, yeah you can probably see how this slow things down a bit. It's all good though, it's finally out and hopefully it was worth the wait. As always, just want to give a huge thank you to our Patreon supporters. And of course, an extra special shout out to our top patrons, Derek Dross, Jesse Spencer, Jump Rock, and Sina. 
All of your support and generosity is very much appreciated. Other than that, thanks again for watching everyone and hope you have an awesome day. This is Corbin from Gaming Productions. Until next time.